All right, gang, welcome back. Chapter seven. We're going to be talking about outpatient care today. Uh, and I subtitled this, uh, the, the, the lecture there and back again, which is a little play on, um, uh, the Hobbit. So if you're a, a Tolkien fan, uh, the Hobbit is, uh, is subtitled there and back again. Um, so the reason I'm subtitling it there and back again is because we've seen a trend from, um, virtually all outpatient care historically uh, to, to a fairly centralized hospital centric system. And we're seeing uh, uh, movement back out again. So pre really pre 1950s, when we have a real explosion in um, uh, uh, in the building and, and you know, construction of, of hospitals throughout the country um, uh, and really kind of pre 20th century medicine, you know, medicine just in general was low tech and low value. Um, you know, so even the university trained, so I'm going to keep hammering on this, you know, your university trained top, uh, you know, Harvard or, or whatever the Europeans were because they were, you know, considered far more sophisticated than, than Americans, you know, through the, through up until the 20th century. You know, if you got some fancy European trained doctor uh, in, in the 1800s, um, early 1800s, right? He was still uh, functioning with, you know, 2000 year old, uh, uh, you know, uh, philosophical approaches to medicine, you know, bleeding and giving you diuretics and, and all kinds of nonsense that really, for the most part, didn't, didn't, didn't actually uh, help, right? So a lot of what medicine was, uh, was uh, sort of palliative, um, uh, which I'll talk a little more about, uh, but but a lot of kind of psychosocial support, um, you know, so you bring in a doctor, your family member is sick, you go get a doctor. Um, this The doctor is a high status person in the community. So you're, you're, you know, showing you're caring and loving for your for your family member, but the doctor really, you know, doesn't add a whole lot of value. So it's much, it's as much about kind of, you know, uh, 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 you know, medical doctors prior to, you know, the kind of mid, mid 1800s, early 1900s really couldn't offer a lot of, of support and care um, because they didn't, they had, they were low tech and low value. Um, you know, they uh, provided most of the care in the home. So you have kind of a picture here of, you know, per, of a doctor visiting patient in, in their house and, um, and then we had, we did have hospitals, right? So we talked about the origins of hospitals. And hospitals were primarily places where poor people went. You know, you, if you were a wealthy person, you got your care at home. The doctor came to you. Um, you had all your care in the home. If you were poor and didn't, uh, and didn't have somebody to take care of you, you wind up in the alms house, right? The poor house, um, where, uh, you know, care was provided by nurses who had, little or no training, right? So the, um, so the physicians didn't have much training of any value and the nurses didn't have training of any, val of any real value. Uh, today, of course, our physicians and our nurses are highly trained with well-developed um, skill sets that all have been you know, empirically tested and proven. And we continue to grow that knowledge base. Um, but, you know, nurses also, uh, didn't understand basic hygiene and things like that. So it was kind of, you know, uh, working woman, uh, poor working women, usually filling these roles, um, providing very, very basic care that, you know, again, they wouldn't have had uh, much knowledge about um, aseptic care and, and so forth. So uh, I've talked about the hospital as the doctor's workshop. And um Really, it was in the, you know, in the 30s, the 20s, 30s, we start to discover, we, you know, as we're progressing into the 20th century, we're discovering things like x-rays, right, and medical uses for x-rays. We're discovering the first antibiotics. We're putting into practice um, uh, uh, aseptic uh, uh, techniques to, to ensure that um, uh, uh, patients aren't getting infections while they're uh, while they're getting care. We're, we're introducing 
um, uh, anesthesia, right? So all these things, and and uh, uh, and they're expensive, right? So the equipment is expensive, and so as the equipment is is evolving um, uh, and coming about, it's hard for one doctor to own, um, you know, some of this equipment. So it makes sense to have a communal place where the doctors can come and use the X-rays, use the ORs, you know, have and, and an OR really is, you know. It's a it's a physical space, right? Of course, with with technology, um, and but to, but more importantly, there's a trained team of nurses and an anesthesiologist and so forth that are all kind of centralized, and that's expensive to to for a single uh, provider to sustain. And so the hospital becomes kind of the nexus of technology, right? Um, and it's and I like this concept. I always go. I go back to the hospital as doctors workshop all the time in my kind of my own thinking about this. So that's why I keep bringing it to you. So you know, um, it's a shared workshop because the tools and teams are expensive to maintain on the outside. So you can kind of imagine in the 20th century, you know, uh, particularly as uh, the other piece of this is, of course. Um, the invention of insurance, right? So, so medical care in the 20th century, the you know, at, from the 30s and onward, are beginning to become actually effective, right? Doctors can actually do stuff for you that that isn't going to make you even more sick, um, and so that that medical care starts to become valuable, right? It was you know historically low tech, low value. Medical care in the 20th century starts to become quite valuable, um, and at the center of the system is really the hospital, because it and it functions like I said, like the doctor's workshop. It becomes a space for shared technology, so imaging, um, pharmacy, uh, uh, laboratory services, right, nursing support for. Um, the, the wards, you know, the operating room. And importantly, you have an emergency department um, where it, which is one of the entry points into the hospital. So what I've done is kind of built around this, the physician practices, right? So we have our primary care physicians and our specialists operating around the hospital, sort of like a, you know, um, like a little solar system with the hospital at the center, like the sun. Um, and so you have primary care practices that refer patients to specialists primarily, right? So, so the way that specialists get patients is, is typically from a referral from a primary care provider. So I've got these little lines drawn to the specialists, but also primary care providers um, historically and still do can admit patients to the hospital for higher level care. Um, uh, but they would also send the patients to the hospital for imaging studies, right? So I'm gonna send you over to the hospital, get an X-ray or an MRI. Um, uh, uh, they might send them to the hospital to get lab labs done, right? Because there are, uh, doctor's offices have some level of cap capability, um, but it's usually quite limited in terms of like laboratory uh, ability uh, or ability to, to do laboratory work. So they would ha rely on the hospital lab. So this is this big kind of, like I said, nexus of, of technology um, that's shared by the community. So the physician, the primary care physicians would both refer to specialists as well as directly to the hospital. The heavy users of the hospital are going to be your specialists, right? So your specialists think again, um, surgeons, right? orthopedic surgeon, general surgeon, right? So something wrong with your, your belly, you get seen by a general surgeon, uh, having bowel issues, general surgeon, think that, break your leg, orthopedic surgeon, right? Um, and then all the other specialties that we've talked about in previous right, uh, uh, chapters um, that rely heavily on technology um, and, and, and that complementary function of technology. So specialists have a heavier, I drew this heavier arrow for the specialists to indicate that they have a, they're much more reliant on the hospital. Right? A general surgeon is not able to really practice unless she's got access to an OR and to um, a facility where, where, patient, where her patients can recover. Um, 
And all of this is paid for critically by insurance, right? Because back when it was low tech and low value, it was cheap. Um, you know, uh, when the doctor really couldn't do anything for you, it didn't have much technology. So it was a cheap thing to get done. Uh, as the technology advances, kind of, it, it, it's kind of advances together. The ability to finance, um, the ability to finance care is critical uh, for the evolution of the care. The care is not going to, you know, the technology is not going to be brought to commercial application unless somebody is going to be able to pay to use it, right? So they, when we discover a new technology like you know, the x-ray, right? when we discover, oh, wow, hey, we could, you know, do this, this, uh, you know, um, expose you to x-rays. And if we put a, a photographic plate behind you, uh, we get a picture of your bones. Um, uh, deploying that and, and, and having it diffused through the system requires that there's got to be some means by which providers can make money from, from uh, doing that. And so there's a profit motive that drives all of this kind of technological innovation um, because somebody's got to pay for it. And so uh, as treatment got better, it also became more expensive. And so we have this simultaneous evolution of the medical technology, as well as the ability and means by which to pay for it. So you could think of the hospital. So this is, you know, uh, so I, I'm a kid of the 80s, right? I came, I was your age in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. And so, you know, I had, um, I th still think of, of music the way that I used to buy it when I was a kid, which was mostly in, in the form of, of albums and then eventually CDs. So I had a whole collection of, of uh, vinyl records, right? Uh, and, then I, and then I eventually got into CDs when, when that technology came about. And so you'd buy a, you know, you'd buy an album. It's got 10 songs on it. Two of them are the, the you know, but you're really only buying it for two songs uh, that you like. And you're lucky if you get a third song off that album, right? Hospitals are kind of the same way. Like you think of a hospital as like a, like a album or a CD. Um, you're buying a whole package. Uh, so you've got operating rooms, associated equipment, you know, and all the staff. You've got nursing care for, for, post-operative care. So, uh, so you go in, you have your surgery, and then you stay, right, for care afterwards. Um, uh, so, you know, the surgeon does, does their thing, and then you come out. And back in the day, right, not that far back, like in my lifetime, um, you know, most, surgeon, most surgeries were, you know, if they were going in to fix a hernia, they cut a big hole in your belly uh, so that they could look inside and, and work. Um, and that required a fairly lengthy stay afterwards because you had a big hole in your belly. Um, uh, and, and it required nurses to care for you after the fact. So a hospital, one of the critical things that a hospital provides is this safe space to, for patients to recover from, uh, uh, from surgical uh, interventions. It also provides a safe space, um, uh, again, workshop where physicians can closely monitor you. So, so you have for medical admissions. So if you're, you know, having a heart attack or you've had a stroke um, immediately after the, you know, you're going to get intensive care uh, provided to you in the facility. And then you're monitored by a nursing staff to make sure that you're okay. So they're constantly rounding and making sure that you're all right. They're using technology to keep track, make sure you're still breathing, all that kind of stuff. Again, also that hospital's got advanced imaging technology. It's got a laboratory, an advanced laboratory with that can provide diagnostic support to the physicians. Um, uh, nurses can provide things like, uh, and this kind of belongs, I guess, maybe up with the nursing care, but you know, uh, the administration of complex medications. Um, you know, so if you've got a serious infection, for example, they, they'll administer um, intravenous antibiotics, uh, uh, you know, so they're putting that, those antibiotics directly into your blood. Uh, dialysis, so if your kidneys aren't working, you have a central point where, um, uh, where people with kidney issues can come and have their dialysis basically cleaning your blood. Um, and then other specialized technology that is too expensive for any one physician um, to, to, to uh, have in their practice. And so 
the hospital provides it and then at, and provides kind of this economy of scale, right? So they 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 buy the equipment and then lots of physicians share using it and it becomes affordable in that way. So a hospital you can think of back in the day and you can still think of it now is like a like a collection. It's like an album or a portfolio, right? So there's a bunch of stuff under the roof of one organization that's shared by the physicians in the community. Now, the problem is that, um, you know, healthcare costs, as, as healthcare actually became effective, right, it got really expensive. And then we decided to go ahead and create uh, Medicare. Um, and in 1965, Medicare uh, cost, uh, cost the taxpayers 3.6 billion. By 1982, it was up to 84.2 billion. Um, and at that time, in 1982, 67% of Medicare spend, right? So 67% of that 84 billion was spent on inpatient care, meaning you were you were admitted to a hospital. Uh, the other 23, uh, 33% is was outpatient, which is the subject of this particular lecture. But you can see this explosion, right, in how much healthcare is costs, and we've talked quite a bit about that. But it was in 1982. It didn't take them, you know, it didn't take the government all that long to realize, ooh, wow, we have bought a big bill, right? And so they started to work out, well, what are we going to do to fix this? Um, so what did they decide to do? Well, in um, prior to 82, so we talked about this in the finance chapter, prior to 1982, hospitals were, ba were reimbursed generally based on a cost plus basis, right? So to refresh under cost plus, um, you, uh, the longer you stayed, the more they could charge, right? Because the more it cost them to take care of you, they just got a, a top off based on the total amount that they that they spent. So if it was 5%, right? I think I use this example, if it's a hundred dollar cost and they got cost plus, they'd get say 5% on top. So they would get $5, right? In, in um, $105 in revenue uh, for, for a $100 bill, right? So the incentive there was to make the cost as big as possible. Um, in 1983, and there were some controls on there. I'm, I'm, they got audited regularly to, to, by Medicare to, to you know, prove that what you were doing was necessary. But still, the incentive was uh, to keep patients as long as you could, uh, to do as much as you could justify because it just fattened up your bills. Um, in 1983, Congress passed um, uh, uh, changes to the Medicare plan that implemented the prospective payment system, which we've also talked about in the financing chapter. But just to refresh again, fixed it's a fixed price um, uh, based on a diagnostic related group. So if you come in with you know, a stroke diagnosis, there's a fixed dollar amount based on the diagnosis that the physician puts in your chart, um, right? Says you've had a stroke or whatever, the, you know, and there'll be a code associated with it, puts that in the chart, that generates a reimbursement to the hospital. Um, and because it's fixed, the it incentivized the hospital to start looking for ways to shorten stays. And this happened overnight, right? Um, hospitals began to, to, to look for ways to shorten stays. Why a shorter stay? Because it costs less. If I'm getting a fixed payment, then my incentive, right? So if I'm saying, I'm going to pay you $100 for this work, and whatever money you have at, left over after you pay for all your supplies and your people uh, and your manpower is your profit. Well, if it costs you you know, right now it's costing you $90, your incentive would be, how can I squeeze a little, you know, how can I squeeze those costs? Because if it costs me 90, I take, I get $100 in revenue, $90 in costs, I get, I make a profit of $10. But if I can squeeze my expenses and get them down to say $80, then I get $100 in revenue, $80 in expenses, $20 in profit, right? So hospitals are run by very smart people. Whatever else you might think about hospital administrators, they're not dumb. Um, and, uh, and their response immediately was to start working with the physicians and the nurses to say, okay, number one thing we need to do is shorten stays because it's expensive to have people in the hospital. And so they started working on that. Um, and then they started, and then the physicians started looking at ways that they could do procedures that would shorten stays. And so 
Um, and then <clears throat> in this process, they began to emphasize outpatient ambulatory services because the reimbursement was no longer supporting um, uh, lengthy inpatient utilization. So one example of, of innovations that dramatically reduced uh, stays was laparoscopic surgery. So I've got a couple of pictures of surgeons using uh, laparoscopic technique. What these are is a, um, uh, is a, they've got a tube with a camera on it that they stick inside, you know, they make a small incision, stick these um, uh, tubes into your, to your belly that have, um, uh, give the surgeon the ability to uh, see, right? So there's a camera on the end of the stick, and then there are tools that they're using to, you know, uh, actually perform the surgery. Uh, so you can see like that scissor thing allows the surgeon to, you know, be moving uh, uh, an attachment around inside your belly. The main thing here is he's not making a big cut, you know, down the middle of your belly that he probably used to, you know, for this procedure, given where all the um, uh, 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 tubes are being inserted probably would have been a great big gash down the middle of your, you know, from your breastbone down to your belly button uh, and, and propped you open, right. Cranked you open so that they could reach in and do the surgery. Now they're doing it, um, you know, doing it through these little, little sticks, right. Tubes. Um, uh, and what's amazing here is because you don't have to be cut wide open. First of all, you're far less likely to get an infection because there's there's only those little incisions for the germs to get in. So that's one thing. Uh, two things. Then the second thing is you don't have that great big wound that has to heal before you can go home, right? Um, and so what this does, what this creates, is a is a whole new idea of minimally minimally invasive surgery. Um, and it speeds up recovery dramatically. So we can take, you know, gallbladder surgery used to be, if you go in and to take out a gallbladder, it used to be like a week long stay. Now I think it's like an overnight uh, or maybe in an outpatient. I'm not sure, I, I should probably check that. Um, but I believe it's like, you know, unless you've got serious complications, you're in and out of there. Whereas it used to be, you know, you'd be there for a week. Um, so, in, and in some cases, surgeries that used to be inpatient uh, were switched to outpatient status, meaning they used to be, you'd get your surgery uh, because they had to cut you wide open. Um, uh, you would have to have, you would have to stay in the hospital for days or maybe even weeks to recover. Uh, but with laparoscopic surgery and other innovations that are minimally invasive, it allows, um, uh, it allowed us it allows us to do many procedures now um, where the patient can come in the morning, get the surgery, and leave by the afternoon. And that's a, that creates an incredible revolution in surgical care. Um, and it also enables you know, hospitals to, to reduce lengths of stay. Um, so the outpatient revolution, I'm calling this, this is my te terminology, um, but, you know, through the 80s and into the, you know, and to, through to today, um, we have seen a reversal, right? And that's the there and back again thing, right? So we went from all outpatient, you know, unless you were poor, uh, to, to a, a hospital-centric system. And now the um, costs... Uh, and the technologies have gotten the technologies have gotten so good, and the costs are falling of the you know costs of equipment are falling relative to the reimbursement, and so things are starting to move out of the hospital. So if you don't need inpatient services, for example, do you really need a hospital? And the answer is, in a lot of cases, no, right? Um, uh, so so you do these minimally invasive procedures, um, and now you can do them on an outpatient basis. So the ambulatory surgery center, like the uh, uh, surgery center of Oklahoma that you, you listen to Dr. Keith Smith talk about, is an example of an innovation that has happened since kind of the, the change to PPS, right? And so it's, it's I, you know, I'm an economist, so I, I think about this, you know, all the time. It, it, it's the money, right? You follow the money. Where there's profit to be made, people will go. So, and physicians and hospitals, healthcare systems are no different than any other industry. They follow the money. And so when the money moved to outpatient, so did the care. So 
um, you know, techniques and technology, you know, the things I showed you, laparoscopic technology is, is just one of those examples, right? Making things cheaper, faster, safer. Um, and so we can start to think about deconstructing the hospital kind of the way that, you know, the M you know, when the MP3 came about, all of a sudden you could buy, you know, you could go to iTunes and buy the two songs that you liked off the CD and, and you didn't have to buy the CD anymore. And CD sales fell through the floor, right? Recording companies started collapsing. It was a whole change in industry that, you know, and you guys are old enough, are old enough to probably remember some of this uh, from when you were young. Um, you know, I haven't bought a CD in, I don't know, probably a decade. Uh, I used to have, I still got a, I've down in my basement, I've got a huge stack of them. We got like 300 CDs downstairs in my basement, all old, old stuff now. Um, but, you know, why would I ever buy a CD anymore? I don't even buy MP3s. I just started, uh, I just started a subscription to, to um, uh, uh, Spotify the other day. Um, I had been using free services and I just finally caved and, and bought my own Spotify. So healthcare is very similar, right? So you kind of think about, you know, you could, you used to have to buy the whole caboodle, right? You have to buy the whole album. Um, uh, now the hospital is kind of, is kind of coming apart. Um, and hospitals are closing. Uh, uh, quite a, you know, many hospitals have closed over the last 20 years, uh, particularly, I, mean, I guess, 30 years now, uh, 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 since, since the change in payment. Hospitals have had a harder and harder time hold, uh, holding together financially. Um, and, it's, and it's because they were originally conceived as this kind of album concept, if you will, Right. And, and the reason they're, they're an album concept is they rely, we didn't talk about this a lot in financing, <clears throat> but the, it's important to understand a hospital. I'll talk some more about it when we get into inpatient, but <clears throat> um, many of the services in the hospital don't really make money or they just barely break even, or they might even lose money. Like obstetrics care in a hospital, OB ward in a hospital typically loses money. Uh, for the hospital. So why do they keep it? Well, aside from the fact that that if they're a not-for-profit, they're supposed to be there to help the community. Um, OB uh, uh, care generates a whole bunch of other services like imaging, right? Ultrasound for your baby before you come, you know, before you, uh, you know, during your, uh, uh, during your um, uh, pregnancy, right? Testing, um, maybe medications, pharmacy lab and x-ray, are um, the major profit centers for a hospital. And so getting the patient into the building is important because then they can sell you pharmacy lab and x-ray, which is where they make all their money. Um, and so when those things start to come out of the hospital, the hospital ceases, what's left in the hospital are the relatively unprofitable things. Um, surgery, of course, is, a, is, a, is typically a highly profitable um, uh, uh, service in, in the organization, but, uh, or for a hospital, but what happens with, with, um, the shift towards those minimally invasive services and the shift towards outpatient surgery is doctors now can, can create ambulatory surgery centers. So, am, so an ambulatory surgery center, I'll talk a little more about these individually, but, it, but doctors like Keith Smith can set up their own surgical suites, right, own operating rooms, and they do the less intensive surgeries that they can do on an outpatient basis, a situation where a patient's not going to have to stay overnight for care, right, they can do them in, uh, 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 in these ambulatory surgery centers, and the doctors can own the ambulatory sur surgery centers. These are expensive, but they're not expensive like a hospital expensive. They're expensive like if you're an orthopedic surgeon or an ophthalmologist, you can afford to build one of these things, get some partners together, and you can build one of these things. And then you can do all your care in there, and you get to keep uh, – you don't have to share the – revenues from, from uh, providing the care with the hospital, you can just keep it all for yourself. Um, so, uh, so we'll talk a little more about ambulatory surgery centers, standalone imaging centers. So, so radiologists can do the same thing. They can buy, you know, they can afford now to buy equipment, set up, um, you know, an x-ray and MRI and so forth outside of the hospital and then compete with the hospital for imaging services. Commercial laboratories. I just had my blood drawn the other day at um, uh, 
Laboratory Corporation of America. It's a little, it was a little uh, phlebotomy operation in Dover that I drove over to a lady, very nice lady drew my blood. I left my blood, I'm sure got picked up at some point and sent over to a central location, maybe in Manchester. I don't know where they are. Um, uh, probably a regional laboratory where the where it got processed. So we have these commercial laboratories that are now competing with hospitals. So it used to be, you know, if you were a physician in the community, you'd send your patient over to the hospital to get their uh, lab test done. Now we've got choices. Uh, you can be sent out to, um, uh, uh, you know, another you know, a, a commercial lab and they can charge less than the hospital. Urgent care centers, right? So instead of a, a Instead of going to the ED, if you, you know, your kid's got a fever and it's nine o'clock at night, instead of going to the emergency department at the hospital, you can now go to one of these urgent care centers that, you know, some of them are open 24 uh, seven. So it's not an emergency care. So you don't need to have access to a hospital. Uh, it's just something you can't wait until morning or you can't wait two days for your primary care provider to have a, an appointment. So urgent care centers are opening up and they're competing with the hospital's ED. Um, and then home health. Uh, home health is is you know enabling uh, both enabling and competing with the hospital. So it's enabling um, shorter stays in the hospitals, but it's also competing uh, for care for the hospital. So I had a I did an interview with a senior executive um, uh, for Kaiser Permanente, which we've talked about in your in your book uh, out in California, and he was talking about trying to do hip replacements. Um, as as outpatient surgery, and so they would have they would do the surgery. I mean, hip replacement. Think about this. It used to be like weeks in a hospital. Now it's a couple of days. It's it's a day or two days in a hospital, and then you're head. Then you go to a um, to a uh, rehab facility, uh, a nursing home that's set up to do a re do, do do rehab. Or you might, if you're healthy enough, go home and have your rehab done at home. And um, and so home health is is one of those things that's going to enable is enabling shorter and shorter stays for more and more serious injuries and illnesses. So that's a, uh, that we'll talk more about home health in a second. Um, and then the, you know, as a result, the easy stuff. So I think what you should be getting out of this is right. The, the kind of bread and butter, simple, you know, simple, low acuity, meaning low, low, uh, uh, the less sick, the less difficult cases are all leaving the hospital and what's left behind are the really sick, really intense things that really need hospital care. Um, and as a result, the ability to shift costs decreases. So remember I was talking about how you could move, like you could have provide OB services at a loss because you can cover those those with radiology and laboratory. But if your radiology and your laboratory businesses are leaving the hospital, then you have less profit to cover down on the areas where you're losing money. So this is a problem for the, the hospital. And it's kind of, you know, hospitals are having the same kind of struggle that record companies had back in the, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, when MP3s came online. So what does this look like? So I took the same diagram, right? The hospital, uh, uh, the hospital is shrinking. Right, its its footprint in the community is shrinking. In the in the healthcare system is shrinking. Uh, less is being done there, but more acute things are being done there. So the so it's still an absolutely necessary part of our health system. But what we see now are urgent care centers, ambulatory surgery centers, dialysis centers, imaging centers, standalone emergency departments. So if you're uh, if you're in um, you know, uh, if you drive up uh, um, uh, from Durham up to Dover and you're on 108, right? Portsmouth Regional just built an, a standalone emergency department um, uh, uh, in in Dover, right in Wentworth Douglas's backyard. So the the environment is changing, right? So so business that used to be done in the hospital is now being done in these other uh, outpatient uh, 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 facilities, right? And there's profit to be made. Physicians can own all these things. Um, and so the physician no longer has to look at the hospital as a communal workshop. They can do a lot of their, of their uh, care outside of the hospital. So I have a friend who's an, an ENT, uh, uh, ear, nose, and throat doc. 
And I was talking to her about, you know, her experience during COVID and she, um, and I was saying, oh, it must've been hard, hard to get into the hospital. She's like, well, actually I do most of my care outside the hospital. I actually do most of my care in the ambulatory uh, surgery center that is attached to her office. So she just like walks through the back corridor to get into the, from her office to the ambulatory surgery center that she shares with a few other physicians. Um, so, you know, so that's, that's the reality is a lot of surgeons now are working, uh, are able to do most of their care uh, in ambulatory surgery centers. Now she still has to occasionally do more serious surgeries um, uh, in the hospital because you know, she's an ENT, so she gets into airway stuff. Um, and that's one of the things that will keep you in a hospital is if you're at risk of not being able, if, you're, if your airways are at risk, you are uh, more likely to be admitted because they'll need to, you, they need that close monitoring. Because if something goes wrong with your ability to breathe, uh, they don't have very much time to fix that. So this is what the world is looking like today, right? The hospital is kind of being deconstructed. Um, lots of other little uh, uh, outpatient operations are coming. So let's talk now about kind of levels of care and how does this fit into the outpatient. So primary care, this is what we typically think of. Did you see your doctor, right? So your primary care doc provides wellness care, um, uh, comprehensive, you know, so primary care is supposed to be longitudinal, right? Meaning it goes over time. So you're, you go back, you see your primary care doc over and over again. They're able to focus on your well-being, your overall wellness. Um, and then they help coordinate uh, care with higher levels of care. So more specialized levels of care, which you tend to have episodic relationships with, right? So you have an ongoing longitudinal relationship with your primary care provider, but if you need a knee replacement, you know, you go and you see your orthopod, he does the knee, she does the knee, and then you go back to your primary care doc and keep on plugging along with your, with your primary care doc, you know, uh, until you need something else from the orthopod. But you don't have an ongoing longitudinal relationship with your orthopedic surgeon the way you do with your primary care doctor. <clears throat> Importantly, they provide this care coordination function, which should, uh, in an ideal world, um, allows them to uh, organize and orchestrate your care with um, higher level providers. So secondary care, you're starting to, you're, is where you start to hit your specialists, right? This is, it should be occasional, um, unless you have some sort of chronic illness, in which case you might have a, a longitudinal relationship with a particular kind of specialist. Um, uh, but this is where you get your specialist care, right? So some examples, obstetrics, joint repair, replacement surgery, right? These are kind of bread and butter surgeries uh, and they may either be outpatient or inpatient. So what we've been talking about with like the ambulatory surgery center, you can get a knee replacement on an outpatient basis. Um, higher level than secondary care is tertiary care. This is complex, usually, usually involves some inpatient care. Uh, definitely things like trauma. So some examples, trauma, Right. If you're in a major car accident, um, uh, you'd go to a trauma center. Um, if you have a baby uh, that has serious health issues, uh, you'd wind up in a, in a neonatal intensive care unit, a NICU. Um, those are examples of tertiary care. A new category of even higher level care uh, is being referred to now as quaternary care. I always have a hard time saying that, quaternary care. And this is kind of your your super experiment, you know, it's your experimental, super specialized things like organ transplants um, and experimental treatments. So just focusing on primary care for a second, I just want to say a few more words about primary care because that is so central to outpatient care, but not all outpatient care, hopefully we've made clear by now, is primary care, right? So there's a lot of specialty care that can be provided um, uh, on an outpatient basis. But primary care, it's holistic, right? It's focused on wellness. Ideally, it's the point of entry for you to, to access the healthcare system. Um, so you should have, you know, the, when you are sick or are or, or, or injured, ideally you'd be able to access, you know, care through your primary care uh, provider first. And then your primary care provider performs this um, gatekeeping and referral process. So the primary care provider has a better idea of what you might need from a specialist. And so the primary care provider talk to you and be like, all right, 
these things I can handle for you. You know, I can order you some Motrin or whatever, but you know what? I really, I, I, I can't diagnose what's wrong with your, you know, your hip. I'm going to send you to a specialist, a hip specialist, right. Um, you know, uh, or, or maybe, you know, a, a, a rheumatologist or something else. Right. So the, so the, the primary care provider has a better understanding uh, of the complexity of all the specialty care and what could be done out there. And so the idea is to keep you at the lowest level possible of care. You don't want to go to a super specialist if you don't actually need to go to a super specialist, first of all, because it's expensive. And second of all, one of the things I like to, you know, that, that I have learned and I, there's definitely some truth to it is surgeons like to cut, right? Uh, medical doctors like to give you medicine. Um, you know, me uh, uh, internal medicine doctors like to give you medicine. Everybody likes, you know, everybody, all these specialists are like hammers and you look like nails to them, right? So they want to do whatever they do. That's not to say that it just, they're typically going to err in the direction of, oh, I can, I know I can do this thing for you. So you want to interact with specialists as little as possible. Um, uh, and so the primary care provider is the person that's going to kind of keep you uh, in the loop uh, and and at the appropriate level. Uh, so supply uh, under managed care, the primary care provider has has become a gatekeeper, meaning they they give you permission to go to see a specialist. So it's not just that they're kind of evaluating what you need to go do. It is also um, under most managed care plans, you have to get a pre-authorization through, um, uh, 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 through your primary care provider saying, yes, uh, Bonica, you can go see an orthopedic physician instead of, you know, uh, in, in order to do that, I have to see my primary care provider first. Um, so the physicians that work in this field, like we've talked about family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, and then you have a lot of mid-levels and there's a growing presence of mid-levels. So family nurse practitioners, F FNPs, and physician assistants, right? So there's there's a increasing no presence of these mid-levels in primary care. And there's lots of evidence that they are perfectly good at providing um, primary care. Uh, uh, my primary care provider is a nurse practitioner. Uh, and I've had PAs and nurse practitioners much of my adult life because the military um, led the way in uh, the utilization of mid-levels. Um, you know, so uh, we were already, and in fact, PAs, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, really kind of grow out of the military health system uh, and have really kind of taken hold in the, in the, um, in the civilian sector. Uh, uh, and the military used them as physician extenders. Um, and so it, you know, it's cheaper um, and, and, and effective care. So we talked a little bit about ambulatory surgery centers. So the example, uh, you know, the, what we listened to that first week, Surgery Center of Oklahoma is an example of an ambulatory surgery center, right? Uh, you get outpatient surgery there. It's surgery that doesn't require an overnight stay. Typically, if, you know, uh, so it's going to be your less complex procedures. Um, uh, this lowers the cost of getting the care because hospitals are expensive. Um, they're expensive to build. They're expensive to maintain. They have a whole complex level of, of uh, you know, they have to be prepared to provide the highest levels of care. Whereas an ambulatory surgery center says, we're not, we're, we're not even going to take the case if, if it's too high a level. Um, and, you know, follow the money. These things can be owned by, by physicians. So surgeons uh, frequently invest in um, uh, uh, ambulatory surgery centers now. And you can see different specialties. Like I mentioned, my friend uh, who is an ENT doc, you can definitely see opth ophthalmology, right? So, so uh, eye doctors uh, working, you know, running, you know, buying their own LASIK uh, laser uh, and other services, orthopedics, definitely, um, and so forth. Uh, another service I want to talk about a little bit and is hospice. And we're going to come to home health in a minute. And we typically think of hospice. I typically think of hospice. I envision care in the home, but it can really be, it's really not a, hospice is not a location um, based care. It is an approach to care. So it's not a particular kind of, it, it, well, it is 
I shouldn't say a kind of particular kind of treatment. I'm going to change that slide. It is a particular kind of treatment, but it's not in a particular place. Um, so it's an approach to care. Uh, so a physician has to determine that the that that you as a patient have less than six months to live if your disease or injury runs its normal course. And so care, when you agree to hospice, and you do have to agree to it in the United States, care shifts from curative, meaning they're trying to heal you, to palliative, meaning they're trying to make you comfortable. Um, and so, for example, uh, if you are a cancer patient and you agree to hospice, what you're basically saying is, I'm, I'm not going to fight the disease anymore. Uh, I'm going to stop taking chemotherapy. I'm going to stop getting surgeries. I'm going to stop getting radiation treatments. I'm going to let the disease run its course. And I just want you to make me comfortable and help me um, uh, accept my fate uh, in these last, you know, months, days, weeks, months. Um, and so palliative care really focuses, instead of trying to cure you, it focuses on your quality of life. So for those days, weeks, or months that you have left, what they try to do is make you comfortable. They try to ease your stress as well as your pain. Uh, and they help you with kind of spiritual preparation, right? They help you accept your coming uh, uh, death. Um, and it really can be administered or, or delivered in any setting, home, nursing, you know, home is the preferable one, a nursing home or a hospital. My father, I, I've mentioned, was a um, uh, is a retired physician. He was a pathologist, so he ran the laboratory. Um, but he was also one of the first uh, board-certified palliative care physicians in the state of New Hampshire. Um, and the reason he got board-certified in palliative care was because he was the medical director for a one for the hot for the uh, hospice in Cheshire County. And so, um, uh, so he used to uh, uh, work with the hospice teams, and he would go out and visit patients in their homes, and manage their medications, uh, in conjunction with uh, the, um, uh, the nursing team. And so he would order things, you know, uh, 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 pain, pain management and other things like that uh, to help the patients, um, uh, you know, have a good death. Uh, and, and that's frankly, you know, that's really what it is, is, is we're trying to have you help you. Uh, hospice is trying to help the patient have a good death to, to, to suffer as little as possible. Um, and it was cool about his role was he was because he was the, the, the hospice folks liked him because he worked in the laboratory. So they always knew where to find him. They could always call him because uh, he didn't actually see patients except when he was doing the hospice work. Uh, and he really enjoyed the hospice work because he got because he got a chance to see patients. Uh, and uh, and and he was a he's a very uh, devout Catholic. And so he saw this as a religious um, uh, mission, even though he, he wasn't in a preaching role, wasn't a religious it wasn't a religious function, but he, you know, this, that was what motivated him. Um, so, you know, I used to see him, uh, I'd come home from college and he'd be, you know, come home from work, grab his, his little, um, uh, black doctor's bag and head out into the woods around, uh, around Keene. It was pretty cool. Um, so one of the most exciting and growing areas of healthcare is home health, right? So, Pulling, pulling patients out of the hospital and back into the home. So there's that there and back again thing, right? So we're, 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 we're doing everything we can to move care back into the home. Uh, so the future is the past, right? Healthcare at home. In fact, uh, many large hospitals like Mass Gen Brigham uh, are implementing what they call hospital at home, which is, a, is, is the deployment of um, high levels of technology of monitoring and care uh, into the home. So it's really just a fancy word for home health, uh, but it's managed by, uh, uh, by the hospital. Um, and so hospitals are getting into this gig too, right? So hospitals are building ambulatory surgery centers. They're building imaging centers. They're building, um, uh, they're creating home health agencies. And so like Exeter Hospital, for example, has uh, Rockingham VNA as part of their, their health system. So Exeter Health Resources owns core physicians, Exeter Hospital, um, and, and Rockingham VNA. So it's all kind of one system. Um, Hospitals are, so why, why home health? Well, hospitals, first of all, are dangerous. Uh, we've, you've read about iatrogenic disease. This is disease uh, and harm caused by um, 
by medical care, right? So it's it's medical errors. It is just you know uh, some of the risk of 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 getting this complex medical care. Hospitals are super expensive, right? The, the physical infrastructure and the complexity of the systems is expensive. Um, but on top of that, um, home health is being made cheaper and the quality higher because of, of revolutions in technology, right? The fact that we carry computers in our pockets, right? So cell phones, right? This communications and monitoring, as well as, you know, a medical equipment that would have uh, sat, you know, would have had to sit in a hospital because of its physical size uh, is becoming smaller and more portable, right? You think about um, uh, even in your lifetime, the processing capabilities of computers have just exploded um, in terms of, uh, in terms of, of their capabilities. Um, and so, so what's happening is it, medical equipment is getting smaller, more portable, and so we can take and do more in the home in a mobile mode. Um, some examples of different providers, of course, you have RNs, uh, LVNs, LPNs, home health aides, so like an LNA, but uh, trained to, to do the work in the home. Uh, physical therapists and occupational therapists go out to the home, um, speech therapists, uh, uh, and speech and language therapists, right? Um, and then reimbursement is moving in this direction as well. So uh, policymakers are, are understand people would prefer to stay in their home and get their care in their home. They don't want to be in a hospital if they can avoid it. And so policymakers, as well as insurance companies, are moving to reimburse better for home health because it's good for the patients. All right, last slide. Um, complementary and alternative medicine, or CAM. It's also now being called integrative medicine. Um, this is, you know, so the thing to understand is it's medicine, right? But it, uh, uh, and medicine, we have to understand, is an applied science, right? So doctors are always looking for, uh, and research, or healthcare researchers, and, and you see research being done by nurses and PTs and everybody in the healthcare field. Everybody is in, in the field of healthcare. It's an applied science. So we're taking scientific revolutions and we're trying to apply it to healthcare and looking for things that work. And we still don't understand why many of the things we do work, but they do, right? Um, and so some of the stuff that, you know, uh, 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 was um, uh, inherited from ancient traditions just uh, emerged because it worked. And because it worked, they kept using it. Um, and so uh, this is true. And so some of the things that work, we don't understand why they work. They just do. And so this is true of both mainstream medicine as well as CAM approaches. Now, typically, um, we're thinking of things like uh, uh, a, a variety of things like, uh, um, well, I've got a list here, right? So complementary approaches. This is a list from the um, uh, NIH. Uh, so we have kind of broad categories of nutritional, um, psychological, physical, uh, and and combinations of, of kind of the above. So, you know, when I was a kid, uh, anybody who meditated was kind of a weirdo, right? But today, you know, all the cool... Um, uh, executives, you know, all the cool uh, um, uh, tech executives are bragging about how they're, you know, they're on um, Headspace or or these other meditation apps. So like, that's a thing everybody's doing now. And when I was your age, people had been like, you're a weirdo if you're meditating. Um, uh, but, you know, meditation is critical for controlling stress and stress is a critical component to, to wellness. Right, chronic stress breaks down the immune system uh, and leaves individuals more vulnerable. Um, and you know, one of the interesting things about about stress uh, is is it materializes and shows itself as particularly acute stress shows itself in different ways culturally. Um, so this is I've had conversations with a lot of um, I've taught a lot of physicians uh, over the years in in different courses that I teach, and I chat with them uh, occasionally. And, and and cultural differences, particularly around stress, are kind of 
kind of humorous and and but also challenging. So in the United States, for example, and I'm going to be these are super generalizations because it's definitely not true across the board. But but if you talk to enough physicians, they will st- they will tell you uh, this is true. So in the U.S., uh, serious you know acute stress often manifests itself as as a really bad headache, right? As a migraine. In Japan, acute stress shows up as a stomach ache. Um, and so, you, you know, if you're, if you're in the U S and you've got an acute headache, um, you know, if you go to see the doctor, they could wind up treating you for your symptoms, uh, and maybe checking you out for say stroke, um, because you're, because you're claiming to have this incredible headache, um, when in fact, really all you have is, is acute stress. Um, you know, Japan, if a Japanese patient comes in and is complaining of stomach pains, you know, we could be ordering, you know, a doctor might be ordering a bunch of tests, maybe an endoscopy where they stick a tube, a camera down your throat to look around when in fact, it's just, you know, it's just acute stress. Um, uh, I, I, a lot of, um, a lot of young soldiers marry, uh, go to Korea. Uh, we have, we have a lot of soldiers in Korea. We have what we used to, we have fewer now than we used to, but, um, and they go over there and they get married to young uh, Korean uh, women. They bring them back to the United States and they get seen in military facilities. I had a physician, a uh, 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 student of mine, who's now a friend, who was telling me he used to treat a lot of, of young Korean women. And one of the ways that young, young Korean women express extreme stress is dizziness. And he would wind up having to, um, uh, uh, refer them for um, uh, uh, CT scans, which is a, a, a of the brain, uh, because they were presenting with with um, symptoms that the norm for treatment would be a CT scan. He, he, but he was, you know, knowing the patient, saying, okay, this person is a you know a Korean um, a Korean descent. Uh, Culturally, this is how they express stress, but I'm going to ha- I have to order the 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 CT scan anyway um, because uh, because uh, uh, that's the standard of care. Uh, even though he was 90% sure, 99% sure that that the patient didn't actually have those illnesses. So stress is is a really interesting problem. It's kind of I find those cultural comparisons kind of funny. Um, but challenging, and the and there's some really interesting literature on on stress and how it how it it leads to, uh, um, you know, chronic stress can lead to a lot of chronic illnesses, heart disease, cancer, and so forth. So, complementary approaches um, can help, a particularly uh, I, the way I see this, particularly is is to reduce chronic stress, uh, but they can actually have real, you know. Uh, they they have real impact. So uh, acupuncture is one of the ones that I always was very suspicious of, um, just because it's so culturally foreign to me. Um, uh, but in recent years, um, they uh, uh, physical therapy is and, and and anesthesiology are are studying and using acupuncture techniques. Um, uh, now and they and they have a of course they they changed the name to dry needling to make it sound more scientific, um, but they're using it for pain control. And again, we don't really know why it works. It just does, and that's medicine. A lot of times we just don't know, we don't know why things work. They just do. And so if you're a scientist, which is what our you know our medical profession is science based. If you're a real scientist, you're going to be open minded to possible alternatives from what is your kind of mainstream approach, um, recognizing that that alternative medicines may not, alternative practices and complementary practices may not look familiar to you, but if they work, they're good. Um, and so, so CAM is becoming more, you're seeing more of it. Um, you're seeing physicians opening up to other uh, approaches. Um, recognizing that you know if if nothing else if they can help if it can help control stress it can improve a patient's well-being all right so that is it for outpatient care i haven't covered all the material in this chapter i'm going to leave that to you to do um but uh 
but hopefully it gave you a good uh, uh, cross-section of, of some, some interesting concepts.